So next, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Kunati. Yes, Dr. J. P. Mulel, uh, who is patiently here, listening to all of his students. Uh, he is going to talk on two talks, summarizing results, and uh, sorry, that's tomorrow's. According to the schedule, my talk is over. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, I had had this experience before, and I had finished the talk with those lines. Uh, for some reason, we have in India the system of, you know, time being ignored. I get hurt because I'm an epidemiologist. In epidemiology, the most important variable is time. Now, most of us have limited time, and as you grow older, you're very conscious of the time. And I don't want you to spend even one minute here if you are not listening to what I am talking about. Now, you should forgive me. I am very old-fashioned. My computer skills are not good, so I still use my chalk and board. That looks better than the earlier one. Now, <clears throat> let me start with where, where Barun left off. A few months ago, somebody came to Velo from the United States and uh, he met me in my department and he shook hands with me and said, I'm Jack Hamilton from Florida. And I said, I'm JP from Velo. Okay, and we introduced. And this guy went through this door and came out to the other door. He saw me again and he grabbed my hand once more. Hi, I'm Jack Hamilton from Florida. So I said, I'm JP from the law. Again, he went through this world. And believe me, in the next half an hour he was there, he shook my hand six times. Now, can you, can you figure out what is going on? No. <laughs> uh, what? What is going on? Uh? What is going on? The pop, what is going on is very simple. This is this guy's first trip to India, okay? And all Indians looked alike to him. <laughs> so he was not taking any chances. He was grabbing every Indian hand and introducing himself. I experienced it because I did the same thing I went to Vietnam, okay? All of them looked alike to me. I just met a wonderful lady, she was so helpful, and I came out through this door, and there she was standing, and I smelled, smiled at her. That one gave me a tough look. What Barun today was talking about was this subject-to-subject -subject variability. How big is it, subject-to-subject? -subject? When you look at crows, they all look alike, right? But the crow knows, which is a jack crow, which is a jenny crow, okay? They know each other. So our variability, and thank God for the variability, if you all looked alike, talked alike, sang alike, it would be a boring place. How do you capture the subject-to-subject -subject variability? That is what the talk was. On this beautiful thing called standard deviation. And you know what? Most of us don't even read the word standard deviation. You ignore it. It's usually hidden in a bracket. Okay. Now, let me tell you something. When I go to Bangladesh, I feel I'm a very tall man because generally Bangladeshis are shorter. Very comforting. Then when I go to Netherlands, I'm in trouble. All are tall. Even women are tall and I look up like that. Now, when you look at that, this whole means, mean has shifted com completely. Bangladesh got low mean and Netherlands high mean. But if you look at the variance or standard deviation, they are same. That is the magic of human population or most biological factor. The variability remains more or less constant. But the means shift all over the place. So in generally I believe that God created standard deviation and society created means. You know? It is very fundamental to us. When you look at the quality of information published data, 
the way you look at is when you look at the standard deviation the too much noise standard deviation become big okay errors enter in the robustness of a person's clinic data collection is reflected in sd so he taught you sd and i am going to give you a test all right it's fun to have a test now one of the things i do all that i have done lots is to conduct deliveries you know i am not an obstetrician but in my practice i had to do it thousands of babies are given you know, brought out and um, it's wonderful but let me ask tell you something in velo i have been monitoring mean birth weight for last 30 years and it has remained constant 2.8 kg can you see this 2.8 kg because questions will follow for one seven minute the standard deviation i tell you i am making it up slightly was 300 grams this is mean the standard deviation 300 grams let us assume birth weight is normally distributed the first question is can you guess what proportion of the babies will have weight above 2.8 kg that is brilliant next question is tougher what proportion will be low birth weight what is low birth weight so what proportion of babies will be less than 2.5 what is it check okay can you hear me through this what proportion will be less than 2.5 kg so that is a distribution you remember the thing one sd on either side this will take care of 34 34 now we are asking this bit is 50 percent and this much will be 16 percent so the percentage of birth will be 16 percent anybody got a problem No no I gave you the data 2.8 is the mean 300 grams is the sd so one sd below that will be 16 percent got it now the next question what proportion will be large babies that is 3.4 kg and more this one i put him brilliant you got it how because this is 2.8 kg two standard deviation will take you up to 3.4 and that will be 2 and 1/2 percent i'm demonstrating this because when you get in the data on mean and standard deviation immediately you become a fortune teller you can predict you can look at the data and start talking about the population how it will be distributed remember this gives you a measure of subject to subject variability you may do it with 60 100 subjects but then the whole population you had to give prediction and that is why this is so important 
the standard deviation is a key to biostatistical analysis. Now next is a very sad story I had in my life. This happened actually in 1981. A young PG, who had just finished PG in community health, presented a paper to the Indian Association of Preventive Medicine. You know what he did? He examined 1,000 children thoroughly. Thoroughly. And then he presented the data. And then he found one of the things was how many of them had worm infestation. And he said, told them, and 20% had worm infestation. So somebody asked him, how did you know? Oh, I asked the child. Asked the child? No, 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 I asked the mother. Now, that is not the way to measure worm infestation. So they told him, she should have measured, looked at the stool examination. He was livid, very angry. What do these fellows know? Examine 1000 uh, stool samples. Am I nuts? So I suggested, well, you could have just done a sample. Sample, ha ha ha, that won't work. I said, why not? Because I may take the guy who doesn't have the stool, as it is you worm in the stool, and miss the one which has. So I told him, listen. That's all right, nah. it will all work out. For example, when they do TCDC on you, they don't take whole blood and start measuring, they only take one drop. <laughs> he looked at me in amazement, he said, wow, I didn't think of that. Then he told me, next time I present the paper, I'll tell them I took a sample. <laughs> Dirty rascal. But, so I get worried when I teach you something. But there is something magical about the sampling. Okay? And very often we don't catch on to the thing. Let me show you how this sampling works. And you will suddenly get a feel and confidence in taking samples. Because small samples, well taken, tell a whole story so effectively. You will be very proud of yourself. I am going to start with my universe. My universe has got four people and they have some values. Doesn't matter what it is. And the values are 3, 5, 7, 9. You understand? That is my universe. Now what I am going to do is, I am going to take sample of size 2. I got a very small sample size. Now I am going to take what is called all possible samples. You heard the word? All possible samples. I get 3 and 5, 3 and 7, 3 and 9, 5 and 7, 5 and 9, 7 and 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Can you show me one more sample which I missed out? Can't see the board, no? I have exhausted. That's why I called it all possible samples. I have taken all possible samples. Nothing more is possible. In other words, if you take any population of capital N and take a sample of size small n, there is a distinct number of possible samples. And we can mathematically derive how the samples will behave. We don't have the patience or time to do that, but we'll pictorially develop what happened. I'm going to find the mean for this. Mean is equal to 4. This is 5. 6. 6. 7. Now we need to turn on our imagination. Okay? First question I'm going to ask is, Hey, 
these are all the means of each samples all possible samples each of the means what is the mean of all possible samples six that is six by the way what is the population mean six wow not bad the mean of all sample means is equal to exactly equal to population so our sample first of all comes and say hey i am a valid estimate of population mean because mean of all sample mean is equal to population second question look carefully can you see that there's a crowding around the true population mean so it's not a crowded out here and then tapers off in other words if you take all possible samples and find the mean and draw a curve showing the distribution it will be normally distributed okay you know what i just said this will be normally distributed means we come back to the same predictive ability if only you knew the standard deviation if you knew the standard deviation of sample to sample variability you can do the same prediction we did with the birth weight and that standard deviation is called standard error okay so sample to sample variability you get standard deviation sorry subject to subject variability you measure using standard deviation sample to sample variability you measure using standard error but they also form a normal distribution now this is one little trick you should for keep in your mind if this is normally distributed 95% of the samples will fall within two standard errors now when you take a sample you have only one objective what is your objective guess what the population mean is that's why you are in the business you are taking a sample to figure out where is the population mean now this story is all fine with all the all possible samples but you in real life come with one lousy sample and then you dare to ask the question where is the population value now look at the crooked way this fellows have figured out how to get it you don't know where the value is here 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 somewhere you have got a value from the all possible samples you don't know where your value is but you know one thing 95% of the sample values will be within two standard errors of population value so that means if you take your sample and put two standard errors 95% of the time the population value will be trapped in it so the 95% confidence in the will mean just one thing where is the population mean in this interval are you sure yes 95% sure okay that is your 95% confidence in them let us take a small example and do it okay i want to know what proportion of the pregnant women in my bello district are anemic okay and just for the sake of fun we'll say we think it will be about 50% and i go and take a sample let's say i use a sample size of n of 100 and i get the prevalence of anemia as 50% what is the 50% sample prevalence what do you want to calculate population value 
How do you do that? Simple. You put a 95% confidence interval. And what is the 95% confidence interval? This prevalence plus minus two standard errors. Remember I told you, you take a sample value, put two standard errors, 95% of the time, the population prevalence will be included in that. 5% of the time, you'll be wrong. That you can't help. Now the question is, what is the standard error? You all know this, you must have seen somewhere. Standard error for a proportion is equal to Remember, I told you, standard deviation is constant across. Standard error is a function of sample size. Okay? So, shall we calculate what the standard error is? Can you mentally calculate what a standard error is? So now I am going to put my 95% confidence in 50 plus minus 2 into 5, which is equal to 40 to 60. So when somebody asks me, what is the prevalence of anemia among the pregnant women? Well, it must be somewhere between 40 and 60. Ha, huh, that's too wide an interval. Can't you make it narrower? Do you think you can? Do you think you can get a narrower interval? That is correct. So in other words, you can fiddle around with the sample size to make it smaller and smaller. That means you get a finer and finer. In other words, we should have done what you said at the beginning of our study. Okay? Ideally what I should say, yeah, I think about 50% must be the prevalence of anemia. I want to put a precise estimate. Plus minus, let's say, 5%. And that is how we calculate sample size for prevalence. You need a gut feeling about what the prevalence of anemia is. And also you should make up your mind what should be the precision. Plus minus 10, plus minus 5, plus minus 1, whatever it is. Okay, now I'll just demonstrate to you that how I calculate that sample size. You see, it's all for the sake of the confidence interval. Prevalence that you get from a sample, I'm going to say plus minus 2 standard errors. And I'm going to call this two standard error a letter called D, deviation. So my D is equal to 2 PQ by N. And this D, from the earlier calculation we used as 10. Now I can say I want it to be 5, whatever the number. And accordingly, I can arrange the N. Alright? You see the equation. Somehow we have to solve for the n for any given d and p. Do you understand what p is? p is the expected prevalence about round figure. It does need not be very accurate. And q is 100 minus p. How do you get the n out? The problem with the n is it is actually hidden inside a square root very ugly. So what you do is you get rid of the square root. How do you get rid of the square root? Yeah, you take a duster and carefully rub it off. <laughs> but then this becomes two square and this becomes d square. Okay? Now we are all in good shape. Sample size is equal to 4 pq by d square. Okay? For example, if I want to have a d of 5%, the n will be equal to 4 into 50 into 50, 
by pi square. That is that simple. So anytime you go for a survey, ask what proportion I expect. And I sometimes feel sorry for people. They use calculating sample size. 13.65. Don't use such word. Use round big chunks, okay? Around 10, around 15. That's fair enough. Don't have to have that two decimal point. Okay, that's it. How many minutes more I have? This is for the... Please don't hesitate to ring the bell. The second part is slightly different. Dr. Barun touched upon it and I am going to just mention it how you do it. When you do a study and I will use the example of a clinical trial, the logic works for all other designs. The question is, does the drug work? Does the risk factor cause disease? Essentially, is there an association? Is there an association between an exposure factor and outcome? And the answer may be yes, or the answer may be no. Got it? And I put it there because that is the truth and only God knows the truth. So that's why it goes up there. What you do, you come from the side with a study and then you do a study at the end of it you conclude yes, there is an association or you say no, there is no association. Now if you conclude there is an association and in fact there is an association there is joyful noise in the heavens because my son or daughter has discovered the truth okay god is very happy here also things are not too bad but the problem starts when you are here you are saying yeah there is an association but it's wrong you have made a mistake. And what is the error called? That is called type 1 error. Similarly, or if you are a, some kind of Greek oriented fellow, you can call alpha error. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is type 2 error. When you say no association, drug doesn't work, but then say, actually it works. And there's a type. So your type 1, type 2 error, always haunting you. Now this is the background in which you go and do a study. And there are reasons, emotional, psychological reason. We actually accept a 5% type 1 error. In other words, at the end of the study, we generally accept, we won't go into why you did it quite magical, but there it is. But all the analysis that he gave us, all the analysis plan has a very simple underlying rule. And it goes something like this. You take a different, no, there's a different idea, difference between two groups. Let's take two groups. And then, we are going to divide by the standard error. So I got two values. It may be milligrams, millimeters of mercury, kilogram weight, doesn't matter. When you divide by the standard error, what happens? The answer is number of standard errors. Are you with me? You take any difference between two groups and you divide by the value of one standard error. The answer comes out as number of standard errors. Let's say you get it at 2. Next question you ask is, what is the probability such big difference can occur purely by chance? And the way to judge that probability is using this number. Remember we already went through one standard error different this much, two standard error so much. 
I'm avoiding the word 1.96, approximately 2. Anything more than 2, you say, hey, this could not have occurred purely by chance, very low. So let us reject the null hypothesis. You're going to say, there is a difference. So this gives us the element how to proceed for the sample size calculation. Remember, sample size calculation actually anticipates the analysis you are going to do at the end of the day. The difference has to be divided by standard error. What is type 2 error? Type 2 error is when you say there is no, there is no association, then in fact there is an association. And 1 minus type 2, what is that? That is the power of the study. Remembering this, now we can create the whole cal equation for sample size calculation. I'm going to rub this off temporarily. I'm going to do the final statistical analysis. D divided by, the equation will be, What is the denominator? That is the standard error. That is the standard error for the different. So that is going to be my final analysis. And what am I praying? God, let it be at least two. If it is two, what can I say? I can say, listen, the probability this could have occurred purely by chance is remote. I am going to reject my null hypothesis. So that is what we are hoping. And we call that Z alpha. Okay, now if you look at this equation, I got N1, N2, P, Q. This P and Q are all proportion of some event happening in each of the groups. If N1 and N2 are equal, this equation changes. Then what happens? It becomes 2 P, Q by N. Because your n1 is equal to n2. Now all our task is to get the n out. Right? And how to get the n out? Of course you are to rescue him from the square root sign. And how do you do it? Simple enough. Take a duster and rub it off. Okay? And this becomes d square, z square. Now your equation is ready. n is equal to 2 p q by d square into z alpha square. What are you doing? We have no need to fix it. We have some idea about the p and q. We are going to say for a given difference, what sample size should be there so I can get a z alpha of 2. So you can now fix the equation so a sample size is just enough to get you that magical 1.96 or 2. But then this equation has a basic problem. You know why? Let's say you are looking at the difference between the two groups. of All the equation. And let us also assume indeed the two groups, the hemoglobin will differ by 2 grams. However, doesn't happen that precisely all the time. Sometimes it may be 2.1 gram or it may be 1.9 gram. In other words, there is a pendulum like action more, half the time it will be less. You follow what I am saying? Even though the truth is true, when you take samples and compare, it may not be exactly two. It will swing up and down. In other words, this equation gives you exactly 50% power. Half the time you will say there is a statistically significant difference. The other half you will say, no, there is no statistically. So your equation has a fault. Somehow we have to correct it. 
we have to increase the ability to detect the difference if it truly exists. In other words, we need to give it a little more power. And we add on one more term for the power correction that is called Z beta. Now that is the essential equation. How much power should you give? Usually we say we would like to keep our type 2 error 20% or less. If you are very fastidious, you will say 25 to 10%. If you are really obsessive compulsive neurotic, you will say 5%. But in general, 20% is fine. In other words, here usually when you write the equation, for Z alpha you have a correction point of 1.96 and beta 0.84. And that gives you the what you should put inside the equation. 0.84 for a 80% power and 1.96 for a alpha of 0.01. Why did I take the trouble of showing you this? There is an anxiety that sample size calculation is very confusing. It is not. Many students come to me and say, Sir, I want to do the study. Will you help me with the sample size? So I do the calculation. No problem, 1,215 each. Sir, I have to finish the thesis, please. So I said, okay, I calculate. 625 in each. Please. Now it looks like a patient asking for concession, okay? <laughs> now what do you think I play around with? You make D large enough, samples will be sizely ridiculously small. Consequently, your study also will be ridiculous. Okay, so you know all the studies, PG thesis typically, you know, sample size is small. And, but one thing I know, whichever sample you give them, they usually collect only 40% of that. Okay, so it doesn't matter why you go around <laughs> doing all the sample size calculation. But a good study should be planned properly. Remember, there is a thing about, why do you calculate sample size? Because you want to get away with a smaller sample person. Why? Because one of the problems in all our research in India is that we are not very good at accurately measuring things. We are shipshod as a culture. We think we have an extra chromosome, you know, being careless. Somehow we are not that meticulous in that habit. I want to tell you a story as an end point, you know. During the Second World War, sorry, after the Second World War, started the Cold War between the Americans and the Russians. And Russians wanted to build the atom bomb. And you know what they did? They knew if they put up any factory, Americans will start snooping from the sky and start bombing maybe. So they, what they did, they went to a big hill, dug into the hill, and deep inside the hill, they started the uranium enrichment plant. Nobody could see, and they made it. Many years later, these fellows became friends. Cold War ended. Okay? America, China, uh, Russia, bye bye and all. Okay. At that time, the Russians asked the Americans, I'm not making up a true story. Do you know how much uranium we enrich? So, uh, Americans looked at the notes and so many kilograms. It was spot on. How the hell do you know that? Now, Remember, enrichment of uranium is an exothermic reaction. And it produced a lot of heat. And what the Russians were doing, eh, there was a river Volga coming close to the hill and passing by. And the coolant water they were pumping into the river Volga. And what are the Americans doing? They were measuring the temperature of Volga as it approached the hill and as it left the hill. The difference in tem temperature, you back calculate the total volume of water and you know total energy that is produced inside the hill. From there they could calculate the amount of uranium enrichment. That precision with which we measure and that is important. Especially for PGs, I have one request. At the end of the day when the study is completed, 
There's at least one person in the world who believes in the data. Who? <laughs> at least for that sake, do it correctly. Questions? Wonderful, sir. But I anyway, definitely questions. I am a great believer in sample selection and I think you know if you have taken an adequate number it will be spot on. The larger sample what happens is you tend to make more errors in measurement, more noise comes in. The little study you carefully do, for example, um, I was quite pleased that Obama won, eh? I like him more than the other guy. But did you know that polls, they did. American voting population is about 170 million people, okay, if I'm right. From to know the mind of 170 million, what sample size should you use? Guess. Yeah. Guess. <laughs> yeah. At least, come on, yeah. <laughs> Mindset, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> huh? At least a million? No. The, your sample size is a li little less than 3,000. <laughs> but still you can predict very accurately. Now remember, in my equation... But did they the, predict, sir? Huh? I think they were predicting the other way. No, no. They predicted right? They were, the, towards the end, they were actually moving correctly. Okay. After the sandy... But, the but I thought it was manipulated. <laughs> No, no, not the not the facts. The I think the way Barack Obama did the the election, probably he did the study himself, and he was projecting the first debate between them. Thank you, sir. <laughs>